for the purposes of this video, tone is defined as the overall quality of a musical sound projected from an instrument or voice. <laughs> uh, very vague. <laughs> to understand the primary driving force behind tone, let's first separate out a few things that might make tone confusing to understand. So the first is tone is neither vibrato, which is wobbles in the pitch to simulate singing, nor is it intonation, which is playing a tune. <laughs> I made a whole separate video about intonation. I'll link it in the cards and down in the description box. Vibrato and intonation work together with tone to create a nice sound, but think of each of these things as separate things for now. For example, I could be doing left-handed intonation and vibrato exercises for hours, and it's not really going to make much of a sound. Maybe like like a little bit of stuff could happen, but it's really not until you add in the bow that you get sound. So it's the bow that's controlling your tone, not your left hand. This is the key to getting a more professional sound. Um, and I, I would say that the bow is the most difficult part of violin. There are four things that affect a violin's tone. Three of these can be controlled with technique. Those three things are arm weight, bow speed, and bow placement, which is also called the contact point. The fourth element that affects tone is your equipment, which costs money, unfortunately. Um, for this video, we're gonna focus more on the technique side of everything, and since that's free, and I like free things, and it's something that can be practiced. It's something you can work on right now to improve your tone without spending any money. So let's discuss the first point, which is arm weight. Arm weight refers to <laughs> the weight of your arm transferred to the bow as a downward pressure on the strings. It's easy to use our muscles to like counteract gravity and lift our heavy arms up without really thinking about it. We're so used to pressing downward when we're working on tasks as well. But we don't want to do any of these things with the violin. Instead, use gravity and your natural arm weight to add the needed pressure to your bow, to your strings, <laughs> which is a lot easier said than done. All right, this is a chair. So put your arm on the chair, completely relax. Just let it chill there. Don't hold it up at all. Just like, just let it rest there. <laughs> put your bow in your hand and your violin, like put it, put it on your violin. Right? And then just slide off of the chair and you'll feel a lot of your arm weight naturally sink into the strings. Like that. And then if you just play, you should get a pretty big sound. <laughs> you don't need to press down. Pressing down is when you get that like that like crunchy sound, just let your natural arm weight do all the work. It's a lot less tiring, um, it sounds a lot better, it sounds more natural, it doesn't sound forced, um, and you can get a really big sound. So yeah, that's that's the arm weight exercise with the, the chair, very, very helpful. I'd recommend practicing that really big sound for all your open strings until it feels natural. Like you're not pressing for any of the notes. Um, and then once you have that big sound developed and you can kind of tap into it whenever you want, you can start countering your arm weight to not have such a huge sound. But let's start with learning a strong tone that uses all your natural arm weight. Um, and that's one of the hardest hardest things to start learning. The second point is bow speed, which refers to how fast the bow is moving across the strings. 
that seems pretty obvious. <laughs> is it moving slowly? Is it moving quickly? The speed of the bow actually impacts loudness and the initial attack of the notes. It may seem fairly straightforward on the surface, but it's actually tricky. The bow speed is often somewhat subconsciously influenced by the varying lengths of the note being played. To demonstrate, let's assume there's a mixture of eighth notes and quarter notes that you want to play for a D major scale. Let's see. So if we were to have everything be the same bow length, you know how everyone's like, play with a full bow. I, I don't like that advice. Um, because it sort of gives this misconception that you're supposed to do this like all the time um, but let's let's just pretend that's what we want to do and it's gonna I'm, I'm not even gonna do it very well but see how like chaotic and bad that sounds the shorter notes are louder there there's less control to get that to even work you have to change where in along here you're playing. But if you prefer a more even sound, you really have two options. The first is to try slurring the notes while keeping a steady bow speed. Or if you don't want to slur, try dividing up your bow based on the length of relative notes being played. So if you are using a full bow for a quarter note, an eighth note would be half of a bow. For the eighth notes, I'm changing fingers in the middle of the bow when it's slurred. And if we were to do separate bows, notes in like the half of the bow that you happen to be in and then for 16th notes we would divide it again into fourths to keep a steady bow speed for each note so <laughs> let's see if I can do this as you get closer to the frog because it's easy to add more arm weight which makes it louder so um yeah it's hard it's very there's a lot going on you have to add more arm weight as you move towards the tip of the bow and then as you're closer to here you have to kind of like let, let up a little bit um <laughs> so it's just like constant calibration to try to dial into a steady sound. The third point is bow placement, which is also called contact point. This is actually somewhat two things. Contact point is predominantly where the bow hair is in contact with the string between the fingerboard and the bridge while playing a note. Generally, moving towards the fingerboard creates a lighter sound and towards the bridge creates a bolder sound. Note that upon moving along the contact point region, your bow actually becomes crooked. Playing with a straight bow directly between the bridge and the fingerboard is a very like entry level concept to bowing to just kind of get used to this whole thing. Once we have gotten used to it, it's time to start learning how to play in different areas of this section. <laughs> Each open string is a different feel. <laughs> try to go the opposite direction where you go with the a bow starting because it's really hard to 
have a stronger tone at the tip because all of your weight is like really powerful down here but you have to have that strong bow sound with the arm weight while your arm's like all the way over here quite hard to do <laughs> so definitely don't always just like move to the bridge as you get closer to the frog try also getting there as you're like going to the tip very tricky <laughs> Another element of contact point and bow placement is how much hair from the bow is touching the string. If you look at the violin, there's actually quite an angle. Many teachers tell their students to angle their bow to uh, like accommodate this angle of the strings, but I think this is somewhat interpreted as angling their bow hair as well, and so people end up playing on like a thin edge of their bow um, but this I think affects tone in a sense of like it makes a weaker tone if you want a much more fuller tone like use all the hair on your bow have it flat against the string um, keeping the full bow hair in contact with the string will um, add a bigger sound if that's what you want also make sure your bow is tightened properly that also affects tone <laughs> now we know the three main elements now let's discuss how to mix them together to create a nice sounding tone. Generally, the closer the bow is to the bridge, a slower bow speed is needed and a greater arm weight is required. So really dig into the string. The closer you are to the fingerboard, a faster bow speed is needed and typically a lighter arm weight is needed. You can really dial in to specific sounds by adjusting these three elements. If you want to create a more experimental tone, try mixing them in orders that aren't typically what I just mentioned. <laughs> so for example, a really fast bow speed with a light arm weight near the bridge would create like a creepy ghost-like sound. Um, which, I mean, maybe you want that for something, <laughs> I don't know. Another really fun thing is to try to practice switching between contact points um, very slowly. It's actually incredibly difficult to do. <laughs> I also want to mention that if you're having difficulties with tone playing harmonics, try playing them with the bow closer to the bridge. Um, so sometimes getting these higher harmonics to work <laughs> is really hard, especially if your bow is too close to them. It can kind of sound mm, scratchy, I guess. Um, but if you move your bow up closer to the bridge, add arm weight, um, so like it create as big of a distance between your finger and your bow as you can um, and then do a fast bow it should sound a little better back to point four which is your equipment so this is my professional violin the majority of my music is recorded on this violin it is worth I would say about two thousand dollars also I have another violin that is the one that I go record music videos with. Let me get it. Here it is. It's, it's like a $200 student level violin, uh, which is still quite expensive, but it's not $2,000. I released a song. <laughs> it's people like buy it and stuff. With this, no one has noticed that it's a different cheap violin, cheap, $200 is a lot, but um, so that kind of shows like how much technique can help. I might, I might do more of that just because nobody noticed. A bit of a caveat though is I did use my nicer bows. I honestly think if you want to really change your sound, get a better bow. Like don't look at new bodies, like look at bows first. <laughs> This is what makes the sound. <laughs> this like, yeah, it echoes, it's like resonating and stuff like that. But this is what makes the sound. 
And you can get bows that create a brighter sound, a darker sound, um, a weaker sound, a stronger sound. <laughs> I recommend looking into bows before dropping a lot of money on violins because you can probably improve your sound a lot and your technique and your like comfort during phrases by getting a new bow. <laughs> Another thing you can do is experiment with different kinds of strings. So I don't even remember what kind of strings I have on right now. But my favorites still are Eva Parazzi's, the, the green ones. Um, am I even saying that right? Like people make fun of me if I would say it. When they're brand new, they're just so like, they have this oomph to them that is just so nice. And then like a month later that, that oomph goes away and they're just like strings. But those are bright strings. Obligatos are very dark strings. So if you have a very dark violin, you can brighten it up with your strings. If you have a very bright violin, you can darken it up with your strings. So you can really change how your instrument sounds without buying a new instrument. <laughs> and I would recommend exploring that a little bit. If you have a student level violin that is not mass produced factory kind of things like those $30 violins on Amazon, I would stay away from those, go to a professional music shop that sells fine violins, if one's available in your town, and look into violins from there where it's like made by a luthier. If factory produced violins are your only option, I would say that's better than nothing. A lot of music shops have rental programs and if you're interested in the violin and maybe upgrading your equipment even to like something fancier, try renting out violins or bows just to see what you like in an instrument. I would start small with strings, then bows. Make sure your bow is rehaired. The other little element is that this video is predominantly focused on acoustic violin playing. If you have a pickup and you try to apply some of this arm weight stuff with a pickup while plugged into an amplifier, do you hear when I play, there's like clicks in my playing as I change bows? Those clicks, while it's important for acoustic playing to like really project, the audience typically doesn't hear those clicks. If you're plugged into an amplifier, those clicks are picked up and they sound like little bass things, <laughs> like bass do 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 every time you change your bow. So you kind of have to not do these tone suggestions if you are playing um, amplified. So just like forget this video. I would say the the bow speed that that helps. Um, don't forget that you want to play in the middle, sort of like what you were taught as a beginner, and focus a lot more on the bow speed and control stuff that I was talking about earlier, that's what picks up well on on amplified violin. Not the arm weight, don't do the arm weight. <laughs> I remember being extremely confused about the word tone, especially with the violin. Music uses the word a lot to mean different things and they all kind of revolve around the word sound. <laughs> I've heard it mean a musical note or pitch, like with the voicemail app tone, please record your message. Whole step intervals in music are called whole tones and half step intervals are called semitones. Even like the mood and atmosphere of the piece is sometimes called a tone. People can talk to you with a tone. As mentioned earlier, like equipment, like different kinds of wood of the violin and the bow shape and the bow hair and your type of strings, rosin even, which I think that's a little debatable about rosin, but they all affect tone. A musician's perception of tone may be influenced by what kind of instrument they actually play. <laughs> For example, like a guitarist, a pianist, harmoniumist, harmonium player, uh, <laughs> who predominantly relies on the instrument itself or like maybe an effects pedal to make a nice sounding tone, maybe referring more directly to how the instrument 
sounds in a very literal way. So how it's resonating, just like the overall color. Is it bright? Is it dark? Someone who plays a bowed instrument like the violin may be referring to that as like the instrument tone when they talk about tone, but they could also be referring to that technique side that I mentioned in this video. Um, hence, I think there is something confusing when talking to different musicians about tone. Like I've been told that my violin has a great tone and that it's, I, it sounds like amazing. And then I've also t been told that I have a weak tone and it sounds squished. So, so maybe the first person was just trying to be nice and the second person was just trying to be helpful. But I also think that there's like the different perceptions. If you play piano, you don't necessarily change what's on the attack end of the hammer while you're playing to get it to sound different. That's, that's, not, that's not even in their radar. But ultimately, we don't want a weak, squished sounding tone, right? It's, it's something that definitely requires a lot of forethought, practice, and repetition to improve. Um, it's not something that comes instantly, and it's hard. It really is hard to keep all these things in mind. But I hope this video helps, and if you liked it and learned something new, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And I'll link again above in the cards and then in the description box that video about intonation. And thanks for watching! Bye! <laughs>